you know, maybe once or twice in your lifetime, you're going to run across a technology like this. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that are going to, you know, spin off from, from blockchain technology and, and crypto and so on and so forth. So, you know, James, the last time we spoke with Eric Brown, he had a company called Crypto Bucks, I believe. That's right. right? Yep. And uh, this time around, I thought it was really great how much his business has changed. And again, I think it's interesting because him recognizing the importance of becoming a platform player mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in crypto, I think is crucial because, you know, rather than making an individual bet on a certain cryptocurrency or something, he's just that middleware that's necessary for yes. ISVs and banks and processors to provide these services. So very interesting conversation that we had you're definitely going to want to listen to it all the way through and just talking about kind of the future of crypto we we mm -hmm. wipe away all the fluff and all the nonsense and all the publicity and say right. what's actually happening with cryptocurrency acceptance and what's uh, going to happen moving forward um then i go into my uh questions in the field and uh today i talk about prospecting and the idea of creating demand um mm -hmm. and how important that is for the isv market as well as for the iso market and then uh patty talk to us about the insiders today uh, we bring an update on surcharging, uh, the New York State rule that went into effect in early February, um, which we really haven't talked about here before. I think we mentioned it in passing a couple times, but right, you know, it's right. just worth. It was. A, I thought it, we had a very interesting discussion about that. Yeah, well, it's, it's actually super important. I mean, if you have any oh, yeah. merchants doing dual pricing, cash discounting, surcharging, anything differential pricing in New York, you need to listen to the segment. If you haven't seen this law, it's it's actually uh, crucially yeah. important. So, with all that being said, uh, Eric Brown uh, and Blockwire, neither are consulting clients or advertisers or sponsors or any of that. Uh, but we're just having a great interview with an industry expert, and so let's dive into that interview with. Eric Brown. Let's do it. Hey, everybody. Patty and I are here today with Eric Brown, CEO at Blockwire. How are you doing today, Eric? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? Doing Fantastic. great. Doing great. Yeah. I have so, to ask you, because James may be a little young for this. Maybe you are, too. The Blockwire, was that a knockoff of Blockbuster? <laughs> well, no, but it it, it has similar, similar uh, reference to that's where what I thought. potentially the U.S. dollar is going, similar right? to the Blockbuster. We're far well, I'm really that. looking forward to this uh, conversation today, Eric. We're going to talk about uh, crypto, and obviously there's been a lot of uh, things happening. I mean, as we're recording this, we're seeing Bitcoin go up, what is it, above yeah. 50,000, right? Uh, yeah, so it's been quite some time. Yeah, so we're seeing a, a big increase there and a lot of other news stories that have been happening and, and things of that nature. But what I thought we'd do to start out with here, Eric, is tell us about Blockwire a little bit. What's the story of this company and why did you end up, you know, kind of moving forward with the, this Blockwire concept? You know, we, we, you know, been in crypto since 17 and we just, you know, we saw the ups and downs. But one of the main things that we saw was infrastructure and there was a lack of infrastructure and a lot of the infrastructure got taken out. You know, a couple of the banks, um, you know, SBB, Signature. Um, so they had Signet, uh, some of the trust right. companies and so on and so forth. And then some of the payment companies that were some of the engines behind some of the fintech uh, infrastructure Mm -hmm. they were kind of pulling away as well. So we basically saw the opportunity that, you know, being in payments for a long time, we understood the compliance aspect of things very well. And I think that's where a lot of people that were in blockchain and crypto struggled, you right, know? Right, um, right. So we thought, okay, well, here's a pillar compliance, you know, mm -hmm. let's, let's tackle that. And let's, let's, can we get those products to people? And we're like, yeah, payments, you know, on ramping, off ramping into the digital world. Can we do that? Well, that wasn't a problem. We still have, you know, great relationships, you know, being a payments company. Um, so that was fairly easily done. So that's pillar number two. Um, banking, banking as a service, difficult, you know, but basically FBO accounts, banking as a service and being able to do pay-ins and payouts and be able to get people into a digital platform and being able to get fiat out of a digital platform. So we were able to accomplish that as well. And then basically is is custody, which is one of the big big topics, big right? Issue, right? There's yeah, there's a difference between custody and qualified custody. Mm -hmm. um, we had been with qualified custodians since 2018, since we got into crypto. We knew that was okay. going to be mandatory, so we just started there. Um, and so now we're able to provide qualified custody, uh, two different vendors, two different digital wallet products. And so now we had pillars of saying, okay, we can now go out and provide infrastructure. And that's what Blockwire is. Blockwire is a fintech infrastructure company that brings compliance products, digital wallets and custody products, banking services, and then payments. And we wrap around that with risk right. and security monitoring, not any different than we do in the payments industry every day. So that's really 
What we did, and we added layers of redundancy. That was another failure point that we saw, lack of redundancy in these platforms. And we added layers of redundancy in there. And uh, this has enabled us to bring clients up and, and give them the proper compliant tools to run some of these platforms. Just as a, as a little bit of back, if we could back up just a spec, Eric, you talk about being a payments company. I know you and James and I have discussed this before we got on, started the recording, but maybe you could explain to some of our listeners where you're where you where you uh, got your payments chops so to speak yeah so i'm i'm probably your typical payment story i mean i re i started in in washington dc um selling point of sale equipment on the street you know the most? Uh, trans three yeah trans 330s p250s right? the most card correct right? wow, remember i remember one? yes <laughs> um so that that's how i got started and then you know started my own payments company in 2003 and uh, we moved very quickly into e-com embedded payments, harder to place clients. And that's really where the crypto came into play. It came into play much, much later, but we looked at it as an alternative payment option. And that's our okay. original okay. thought. Right. But then we also got into asset management with the hedge fund and so on and so forth. So we go all the way back to very traditional mm -hmm. payments where a lot okay. of these people that are your listeners, that's where we right. come from. Yeah. Some point, and we'll have to talk offline about the Washington market and the folks at most and so forth. We'd love to talk. To <laughs> learned you about a, learned that. a lot. Learned a lot in that market. That's for Did, sure. Uh, Rick Lyons yeah. and those folks. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Learned yeah. a lot there for sure. So, Eric, you know, when I think about crypto, uh, it goes through these, you know, insane ups and downs, especially in the publicity, right? You know, mm -hmm. we'll talk more about some of these stories and some of the craziness, right? But what I'm really curious to hear from you is. Behind the scenes, we take all that away, right? Ultimately, what we have is we have another method of payment. And, you know, the big question ultimately long term is, is this method of payment going to become mainstream? So I'm curious, what are the trends that you're seeing when you take all the fluff away and all the hype away? What's going on in terms of crypto acceptance in the U.S. market today? So I think what you see is is the underlying technology and blockchain, you know, and the cryptography to it. And and then also the ideology behind Bitcoin. Why was Bitcoin really created? You know, Bitcoin was really created as a kind of a hedge against a, a dollar, an inflationary dollar, you know. Right. Um, so if you break it down to the technology aspect of it, it's just much more secure. I mean, it's an immutable ledger, right? really can't be hacked you can't go back in time and change anything right. there's a finite amount supply if you want to look particularly just as bitcoin you know with 21 million um so it's an inflationary tool so eventually personally you know what i see is i see number one i see the whole payments industry we very well know is moving to blockchain and, and digital currencies we see that with visa and mastercard and you know, we've been watching that for years at this point with stable coins and circle. And, you know, there's all types of, you know, different applications that we're using on a daily basis. Um, but I think eventually what you're going to see is I do think that you will see a Bitcoin as a world reserve currency. It makes a lot of sense. Um, and so the utility aspect is is payments. And it's really something if you saw all the things that happened. So let's talk about the fluff, right? That has a lot to do with altcoins that has a lot to do with the pepes the doge the investment vehicle of what crypto really is but right. the utility you really can't deny of what it can do when it comes to payments and actually moving money around and how secure it can be and cost effective and so i think that if you look at what what do merchants look for or people look for when it comes to a payment instrument um, i think they look for speed they look for security and they look for cost. And uh, I think if you can tackle those kind of three points, um, you you definitely have the ability of creating another payment instrument. And I think that's, that's what we're seeing. Now, as far as acceptance right now, I think the way it's being accepted is starting to change. It was accepted and then converted to US dollars. I think right. what we're seeing now is it's going to be accepted. And then it's going to be a mix of keeping it in Bitcoin, keeping it in stable coins and start mm -hmm. actually utilizing crypto on more of a day-to-day -day basis without having to go into a fiat currency all the time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, uh, like to me, probably the biggest news in, in this field in, in recent months has been the uh, U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission um, approving Bitcoin exchange traded funds. Um, 
What does that mean for the crypto industry and crypto acceptance in general? Yeah, so it legitimizes crypto at an institutional level. Uh, simple as that. You know, they look at it as a stored value right now, and it's it's a commodity. So, of course, we saw the case against Ripple, which right. you know, Ripple just went to bat for the crypto industry and and couldn't thank them, you know, enough for somebody stepping up to do that. Um, so, I, I I think that's what you're seeing. I think you're seeing that now that the SEC has said, okay, well, Bitcoin's fine. Ethereum is probably pretty much going to be the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. Now you have that ability for institutions to get involved and they're looking at it as an asset, right? That's mm -hmm. how they're going to look at it. And they're looking at it as a stored value asset. So much more wrapped around Bitcoin. I mean, so much more on the platform, layer two technologies that come with that, as well mm -hmm. as Ethereum. Same thing. I think sure. it brings a lot of value as well. Mm -hmm. So when you have that, you have the SEC, um, you know, and of course, there's the political aspect behind all of that, but we don't have right. to get into that. We just saw that there was an approval. And now all of a sudden, you've got Larry Fink from BlackRock, you know, shilling crypto on X and, and <laughs> everywhere else online that he can, which is great. Of course, we love that. Right. Um, but Can't really complain. what you do is you... No, you don't. And, and you go from billions of dollars now to trillions of dollars. And you saw today... We'll bring up we hit fifty thousand on on Bitcoin. A lot of that has to do to the inflows that's coming in for the ETFs, and I believe eleven okay. that were originally approved, um, and now recommending a certain allocation of Bitcoin into your portfolio. And so it's big. It's it's institutional big, and that's legitimizes it. And now mm -hmm. that will bring back innovators and builders and infrastructure yeah. companies as well, looking to build upon that. I think that's really a, an important point you make there, Eric, is it's going to bring more of the innovators back because I think a lot of the innovators, you know, kind of got scared off for a while there, you know, um, especially yeah. with all of the back and forth, the regulatory back and forth. Is it, it isn't, you know, is it or isn't it an asset, you know, that. Yeah, ab absolutely. We yeah. saw a big outflow of that to me personally, huge mistake. You know, mm -hmm. this is a, this is a, you know, maybe once or twice in your lifetime, you're going to run across a technology like this. And of course, in our lifetime, we have the internet, right? right. I mean, you know, the biggest out there. And I think this is second to that because mm -hmm. there's so many things that are going to, you know, spin off from, from blockchain technology and, and crypto and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I just believe that, you know, with the institutions involved, um, it, it it enables to bring back people that have, and, and there's so many innovators. I mean, what these guys are doing is, is yeah. really incredible. You know, yeah. um, we hear it every day from clients that are coming to us and pitching us what they're doing. Um, mm -hmm. We had a phenomenal one today that I was really, really high on. Um, so some of the stuff that they're doing is just awesome. And that, that's what we need. We need the innovation back. We really did lose right, that. Right, right. So what are your thoughts on Bitcoin versus other types of crypto? You know, do you see any particular ones, as, you know, it, Bitcoin or any other ones as long term winners, particularly with respect to uh, SMB acceptance? So I, I, I think Bitcoin, number one, is a commodity, ETH, you know, right in there in second place. But what you have to do is look at the underlying technologies that are being built on these platforms. So traditionally, the layer one public blockchain of Bitcoin is, is you know, a, a slower transaction with multiple confirmations and so on and so forth. But what you have now is you have a layer two protocol built on Bitcoin called Stacks. Right. And Stacks is very similar to layer two protocols that are built on Ethereum, much like Polygon. Okay. Okay. So what this allows is this allows you to speed up the transactions. Okay. Mm -hmm. This allows with the same security. And so now what you're able to do, you're able to build DeFi applications. You're be able to build peer-to-peer -peer mm -hmm. applications. Mm -hmm. You're mm -hmm. able to build an NFT application. So NFTs will be huge in the payments world, by the way. Um, so now what you're able to do is build these, but build these at scale. And then you're able to build them off something like a Bitcoin you know, which we know um, being very stable as far as basically the crypto OG out there. And again, um, now it's okay with the SEC, you know, this is commodity. Mm -hmm. So if you look at Ethereum, Ethereum has um, by far more integrations than really any other crypto out there, you know, and really Ethereum really being a platform, you know, where uh -huh, you can uh -huh. build off and Ethereum is the digital economy to that platform. That's what it is. And I think that's where, some people within government 
just don't understand from lack of education that you have to have a digital economy to run these digital, digital. platforms. You yeah. can't do it off of fiat currency. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Right? right. Right. So that's when you're seeing a lot of these cool builds and some things that people can do within the NFT world, within the peer to peer. What do you mean by that is... in terms of NFT with relation to payments? That just really piqued my. Yeah. So about. NFT is non fungible token. So NFTs right. will be issued uh, much like a receipt is issued for authenticity of a good or a service. Um, and receipt of payment and so on and so forth. NFTs will come back in a more utility format. Where right now they were, you know, they were a digital eight was. I mean, right. uh, it's they were ridiculous. like a collector's item kind of thing. It's, it's I mean, ridiculous. It was like Give artists me a break. were the only people I knew who were using them for a while right. there. Right. right. So now NFTs will be issued. Let's say when you purchase an automobile, and okay. that automobile will be tied okay. to a smart contract. So when you right. actually register the automobile, purchase the automobile title the automobile that will done be done via a smart contract but at the end of that you'll be issued an nft and okay. that nft is basically that receipt of authenticity so now when you service that vehicle that nft will get updated with oh. those service records as well when you sell that that uh, that automobile you are now going to transfer that nft as authenticity of ownership that you paid as well as you can enter into another smart contract for actually moving the ownership title abilities okay. but the nft will track all of that data you can oh, use it in okay. sports okay. ticketing sports sure. ticketing tied to uh rewards programs and special right. vip events and so you will see nfts all across the board in okay. every industry out there and it will not be a board a picture of a jpeg <laughs> thank god yeah <laughs> thank but, you god, know yes one of the interesting questions that i have about this is you know, to me, the to me, the the question that matters most in crypto, at least in my mind, is timing. Right. So, OK, is crypto becoming you, you know, is crypto being used more or less than it was a few years ago? More, but still very, very tiny slice of the overall market in terms of wallet share, things of that nature. Right. So in, in the same way, I, I totally agree with what you said, which is there needs to be this kind of digital economy in order to support a lot of these innovations that are possible that would reduce friction and things of that nature. But that is, of course, all predicated on government, you know, adoption and, and changing the way things work. Do you right. see that as a fundamental constraint? And and how is that going to work? Because it seems to me that governments have, at the very least, been extremely resistant to implementing what we would consider this kind of digital economy. I and mean, how, how is this going to, how is it actually going to become mainstream without, we, we have to get the government on board, right? Like, am I missing something there? It's, it's a, it's an excellent question. And it's a actually fairly simple answer, to be honest with you. Um, look, th they, they threw out the kitchen sink at crypto. Let's be honest here. They did, they did everything and anything. There was nothing wrong with Signature Bank, by the way. I mean, they took Signature Bank on Sunday. You know, there was nothing right, wrong right. with that. Usually bank. you don't take a bank on a Sunday. You don't take a bank on a Sunday, right? They have a meeting for that on a Monday, right? And then on know? Friday, so it usually gets. That's started. it. That's it. Right. So they threw the kitchen sink at crypto and look what happened. They took a major L against Ripple, huge L. They took two more L's after that. And so right now it's just simple. Their win loss record is very poor when it comes to attacking crypto. Now they went after Binance. That's fine. Binance was a heavy hitter all over the place. Potential issues there. Maybe, maybe not. Don't, don't really know. You know, they definitely took down some crypto exchanges. Um, but I believe it's very similar to the path of the Internet, how really they thought the Internet was for nefarious activities yeah, and so right. on and so forth. And look where the Internet is now. Take Internet away from politicians now and see what happens. Right. Well, that would be this, nefarious activities, politicians and the internet. Oh, excuse me. That would be. I agree with you. <laughs> so, I, I to answer your question is, I don't think there's anything they can do about it. It's an unstoppable quite honest with you. It's an unstoppable. Here. You know, the train left the station, and it's already gone. You're just not going to stop. You attempted to, and you look. You put out your best efforts. You put choke point two point oh in place, but look what happened. You took some big L's. And now you got Larry Fink out there saying it's Bitcoin, Bitcoin, we're Bitcoin now. That's what it is. So now you're going against people like BlackRock. So what's going to happen? Eventually, they're going to have to cave in. But I do think, yes, there needs to be um, 
oversight, compliance, understanding DeFi, which is going to be extremely difficult, by the way, understanding how a DAO works, right? You know, the, how you, you know, this is a community of people that run it. So yes, there will be some significant challenges along the way, um, but they kind of already lost that one. Interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, thought process on that. So, um, okay. So I want to shift gears a little bit here. Let, let's talk about, let's make this really practical for our audience. So agents and ISOs mm -hmm. are thinking about small business owners accepting crypto. Um, how does that work? So you mentioned that maybe it's not going to be as popular to like accept it and then convert to a fiat currency. But I know that's still something that's happening a lot. Like talked about where mm -hmm. that's going over the next few years and how that really works. How does a small business owner today accept crypto? Should they be accepting crypto? Like talk about that a little bit. So I think what you kind of see is, is specific niche markets, you know, when it comes to SFBs and specifically let's talk about marketplaces. Okay. Okay. So you have a marketplace account, you've got a buyer on one hand, you got a seller on the other hand, and now you're doing this payments handling in the middle. This is much easier using stable coins, by the way, right? So now you have a digital wallet user on one side, digital wallet user on the other side, and now you're interchanging um, funds and you're doing it very quickly and very securely. You're basically doing it instantaneously. That's how fast it is. So that's one market that we would really see. Now you can look at traditional higher ticket type markets when it's cruises and cars and things along those lines where people might want to take what they have invested in assets and use that. Uh, there is definitely a market for that. But I think what we're really going to see is as you see stable coins come in, I think the ease of use for stable coins and as people get more adopted. So as, as Gen Zers come up and they're the more prominent generation using digital wallets, ditching the old wallets, ditching the cards, that's when you'll see more adoption. And you'll see that for smaller business owners, being able to accept that instant payment at potentially 80 to 90% less than what they're currently paying right now, that's attractive. The only reason that they're not super interested in it right now is it's a little bit of the unknown. Adoption does have a certain curve and a certain process to it. The internet will speed that up. And so I think for certain merchants, it's innovation. You know, do they want to implement something like an NFT program around their payments? You know, do they want to start accepting stable coins? Is your particular merchant a cross-border payment merchant? Because this makes a ton of sense to go from USD to USDC and then back out to the euro at the other end. And it happens like that, right? right? Very, very quickly. Sure. And it's a lot cheaper. So you get rid of that messaging system with the wire system. So mm -hmm. that's just what I see. I think you're going to see some innovators in it. I think you'll see some bigger ticket items, but I think you'll see particular niche industries, the people that Stripe supports, that checkout.com supports, Right. Um, ADN supports. I think those some of those merchants in there that are fintech type merchants that are building right. the newest, latest, and greatest. I think that's where you're going to see it. So if you're a payments company like us, traditional payments, we say, okay, look, we need to pivot, and we also need to retool for the future. And that's what we did. We retooled to be able to remain relevant in the payment industry. Mm. So, you know, this is obviously an unanswerable question, but I'm just, just curious. I'm sure you think a lot about this. So like for me, I think about vertical specific ISVs as kind of the future of, you know, these are the companies that are going to have the leverage when it comes to the SMB relationship, right? Is like mm -hmm. they've got their software. It's specifically for a vertical. They're able to bring in, you know, banking as a service, you know, lending, payments, insurance, payroll, accounting, whatever, all customized for that vertical. So my, my question is, when do you see this kind of, you know, there's always this bell curve in terms of adoption, right? Like, when do you see this exponential growth in terms of mainstream ISVs that serve everyday run of the mill uh, SMBs? And they're like, we have to in it, we have to bring crypto acceptance to our merchants to remain relevant. Like, when does that is that in three years, five years, 10 years? Like, when is this happening? Yeah, 36 months, I said, you're really going to start seeing that curve. And, and let me explain to you real quick why. We're less than 100 days from the halving with Bitcoin. Uh, that's a huge event. You have a potential regime change, maybe, maybe not, but it's an election year. It's a big event. You have potential Fed rate cuts as well, which would be another event. This is only going to uh, super fuel Bitcoin's rise and prominence, mm -hmm. where all of a sudden its cap now becomes bigger than Visa, MasterCard, American Express all put together. 
right? And so it, it starts gaining this dominance. And then from there, I think the layer twos that come in and you start getting some of that innovation back and people building for your ISVs and start mm. presenting digital wallet solutions and start presenting right. cross-border solutions and start presenting you know, on-chain reward solutions, on-chain identity solutions, on-chain banking solutions. So it goes, you know, beyond crypto. Um, so I think that really within 36 months, I think that's what you're going to see. And I think within five years, you start seeing some really true adoption. And once you go into seven years, now you're in that second cycle. I think this will be the biggest cycle. That, it is very secular crypto. Uh -huh. That's yeah. why I'm not hurraying about $50,000 Bitcoin. I know where it's going to go. and It's going to be a lot higher than that. It's great to see it. Right. But, you know, we're pretty calm about it. We've been through this already, this cycle, so we know what it's like. Right. But once you get into that seventh year, I mean, you're talking about a Bitcoin that a whole Bitcoin, it will be basically unattainable by the average person, not even close. Right. And so now you've got it to where you'll have Bitcoin in China, you'll have Bitcoin in Asia, you have Bitcoin in South Latin America and different cryptocurrencies, that adoption. And that adoption is going to happen in areas that need it, and particularly Africa and Latin America, sure. where they're leveraging blockchain technology. I think the US mm -hmm. will be actually one of the last adopters because we have the most sophisticated financial system in the world right, right. now anyways. Right. 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 We we don't so need we'll it as we don't need it as we don't much. need it. And we yeah. tend we to be it. the last when it comes to new technologies, just like you know, smart smart chips, right? You know, chip right. cards. That's it. Chip cards took us yeah. forever, right? Perfect what were we outpaced by eight years, maybe close to ten years? Oh uh, good look, at um, least ten, I'd say. By yeah. France, by France even yeah. more. Yeah. Right. But look at El Salvador. Look at what Argentina is doing. Um, right. Brazil is doing the, it a lot. Mm -hmm. Right. There's I definitely mean, there's definitely and, governments that are very friendly to crypto acceptance right now. Right. <laughs> yes. So, and so yeah. I think as a payments company, again, what do you look to do? You look to get out of the box you're in that you're currently in. We see a lot of them in the box. Right. Get out mm -hmm. of that box and say, how can I help or how can I leverage this technology in an area that I don't currently work in. Like right. we weren't necessarily a Latin American payments company, but now there's all kinds of interest because that's where a lot of our customers are coming from. Right. Sure, sure. Right. Okay. So last question I have for you is, um, you know, our audience very well, you came from this kind of same uh, <laughs> concept, right? So talk to them a little bit about what exactly Blockwire does from their perspective and what kind of partnerships are you looking for from our industry? I mean, I know what you're doing now is a little different than what you're doing before. So how could agents and ISOs, should they be working with Blockwire? And if so, how? So I, I would say it's, it's the ISV type relationships, the payments companies that are really focused into that embedded payments and really that user experience. How can I make that user experience better? Right. How can I make it faster? How can I make it more innovative? Mm -hmm. um, and so again, with our infrastructure products, we have people that will bring us a fintech deal, but not realize that payments, you can't just have payments. You've mm -hmm. got to have the banking piece to go with right. it, right? right? You've got to have the compliance right. piece tied into that. You've got to look. And so I would, I would probably say one of the most important things that we look at are flow charts. You know, what does a flow do? So if you have a fintech client or you have a mobile app client, an app builder, um, in e-com, you've got an ISV, they're going to run across this type of business eventually. Right. And you're saying, okay, well, yeah, we do have some of these products. We have payment capability and ACH capability, but you've got to have the ACH capability, particularly for a fintech industry. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to have the banking particular set up for fintechs, you know, um, and then also understanding of digital wallet solutions as well. I think some people in payments are a little bit behind on digital wallets and custody and liquidity and things along right. those lines. So sure. if you've got a, I think a lot of our direct merchants now are much larger, by the way, there's a little bit more margins involved because it's a very unique right. uh, niche type client. So I think if it's a payments company, um, what do we bring to the table is we bring up, we have legal that we set people up with. If you need to understand legal compliance when you're building a product, um, we have that set up as well. Um, and we, I chair the crypto committee for ETA. So we're, That's our right. job heard, is to sure, write. Recently oh, happened. Congratulations. Well, yeah. I appreciate it. So our job is to educate the payments industry on 
you know, crypto blockchain and how you can really inject that into your business. Um, but yes, we have partner programs and all, none of that's gone away. You know, people right. do have the ability of working with us and we can bring that um, to the table. Um, it is very much kind of a referral thing because the guys that we work with and our marketing team and all that's very specific to what we do and have a great understanding of crypto. Right, sure. Um, but I've heard some good conversations where, especially ETA, uh, Transact, yeah. which will be, Transact is finally putting us on uh, main day for a crypto panel. Yeah. So I think you're just going to see it more and more. But yeah, we're happy to help Love anybody it. who's who's got you know that type of clientele. Sure. or a particular client that they need and also high volume clients or seeing clients with, you know, definitely high volume. Yeah. And okay. for those who are not watching, Eric, it's Blockwire, B-L-O-C-K-W-Y-R-E. Correct. Um, Blockwire.com. And, and, and Blockwire.com. I was just going to ask. Okay, great. That's correct. Awesome. Yes. Well, uh, Eric, it's uh, always a pleasure having you on. I love getting your perspective on crypto. I think for uh, you know, speaking for for this side of the payments industry, I think it's like a lot of times we kind of just see all the craziness and this story and that story and all the insanity. But I think it's important to cut through all of that and see the practical utilitarian component here of like this is a payment method. Right. And it's growing. And so we'll definitely have to have you back on to kind of keep us in loop on this stuff as we as we see yes. things continue to progress. And I appreciate it, guys. It's really a lot of fun chatting, uh, but getting the word out there. And like you said, I'm glad we're able to kind of carve away some of the fluff and just say, yeah. look, this is what we work on on a regular basis. Like, right. don't don't buy into the narrative that is being fed online that much. You know, um, right. Visa is doing this. Amer uh, MasterCard's heavy in this. Right. Um, again, companies like Stripe, companies like Checkout, you know, they're all getting involved. We're seeing more banks getting involved now as well. So, right. um, and, and really appreciate it. It's fun coming on here and chatting with you guys and just going yeah. over it. And I'm, I'm welcome to come back, you know, whenever you guys want me, I'm more than happy to. Awesome. Uh, Thanks great. again, Eric. Thank you Have very a great much. day. So Patty, one of the big services that's going to be customized, we've been talking about Blockwire and cryptocurrency mm -hmm. and all that. Big part of this is going to be banking as a service and yes. financial services, right? So right. I think when you look at that future and we're as, you know, ISOs and payment processors are putting together their tech stack to service ISVs and to service mm -hmm. certain verticals, you can't leave out the financial part of the financial services of yeah. banking, lending and all that. If you want to know more about that, I would really encourage you to head over to Nativia dot com slash banking nativia.com slash banking and learn more about the services that they offer in terms of banking as a service it's a way for you to generate income and revenue for your iso additional residual income but it's also a platform as well that you can leverage with isvs and other integration partners so they can bring banking services to their end merchant users so patty today i want to talk about prospecting and um, i think this is a, a crucial component because as we you know, continue to shift in, in the uh, payments industry, one of the things I'm very passionate about is that we don't lose sight of the actual sales component of all of this. You know, right. um, I think it's very easy for ISVs especially to you know, get into their mind, uh, well, if there's a good market out there, people will find me. Um, if I build it, they will come. Yeah. And, and yeah. I, you know, I think to some extent that's true. If you're building something that has broad appeal to the masses, you know, you look at a company like Google, um, Google really didn't do that much marketing to get yeah. themselves going. Same with yeah. Facebook. There was nobody out like prospecting to get people to sign up for Facebook per se. I mean, right. at the beginning, you know, Mark Zuckerberg was kind of doing that on campus at Harvard, but you know, um, but they, they didn't need that because there's appeal to the masses. But when we're talking about selling payments and specifically selling payments to verticals, right? Mm -hmm. There's this core math that happens that's very discouraging for vertical specific ISVs. And that math is there are only a, a small percentage of people who are looking to switch to another solution. Okay. So if there are, you know, let's say there are 50,000 uh, tow truck companies out there. Right. And I have a, I'm trying to sell payment processing to tow truck companies. Well, there's only going to be maybe 2% of those tow truck right. companies that are actively looking for a software to manage their tow truck company better. So if all I have is this inbound marketing and all I have is SEO and all I have is pay per click and all I have is, you know, Captura and things, well, I'm very, very limited in terms of how far I can go with it. Where 
if we have prospecting and we know how to generate our own interest, we know how to generate our own right. demand, well, now it's a whole nother world. And now we can go out and, and because now if we reach out, there might be as much as 10% of that 50,000 mm -hmm. who would be, just, yeah. they might be interested in switching. Right. If if somebody gave them a pitch that interested them. Right. Right. And so, 10 percent of 50,000 is not a bad number. If no, it's not a bad a number at all. Pitch. Right. And so so what I would say, though, is for those that are actually selling or for, as an as an ISO, here's what I would encourage you to do. You got to think about what can you consistently do every day for four to six hours where the actions that are necessarily necessary are entirely in your control. Um, mm -hmm. now this can be a lot of different things. This can be going on LinkedIn and doing networking, going to shows, going to events, um, sending direct messages in Instagram, right. um, walking into businesses, calling businesses, creating, you know, creating a podcast and then calling people and asking them to subscribe, creating a Facebook group for local business owners and spending time in there every day, developing relationships, sending people direct messages. So there's a lot of different things that can be done from in terms of prospecting. But at the end of the day, you've got to remember your objective here is you're trying to create demand. That's ultimately what prospecting is about. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Because if you're just trying to capture as much of the demand as you can that already exists, well, number one, that's very expensive because that's what everybody's trying to do. Because um, it's very limited. It's very limited. So if you get to the point where you can create your own demand, you're going to be in a much, much better situation. And salespeople know this. They've been doing it for a long time, but they may, you know, in a lot of cases with salespeople right now, they don't have the solutions they need <laughs> to fill the, the demand, right? They don't even, they, you know, it's like they're, if, you know, if you're doing prospecting consistently and you're not creating demand, then right. you're selling the wrong thing. Right. <laughs> you have to listen to the market, right? If, right. if you're right. like, I have a new solution. I'm going to go out and sell it. And and you're doing four to six hours a day of prospecting. I mean, unless you're a terrible salesperson, like you should be getting a lot of interest because not very many people are doing that. Right. If you're not, well, it's time to take a step back and say, wait a minute, why am I, what, why I'm not offering people what they want. Otherwise I would be generating interest. So right. that's right. you, know, once you drive awareness of what you have to offer, that should generate interest. If it doesn't, you're probably not offering the right thing, but probably, I think, yeah. but then I think for more of the ISV and software side, for them, they a lot of times have something that would be of interest, but they mm -hmm. don't know how to interrupt people to generate demand, and that's prospecting. Right. And you exactly. got to have that if you really want to scale. Well, if you're selling to merchants in New York, you should be aware that the state's surcharging regulations have changed. Yep. Uh, New York had a law banning surcharges, but uh, that was uh, put on hold back in 2017, I believe that was, right? Yeah. Yeah, with expressions uh, hair design. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. When the Supreme Court determined that the way it was written, uh, the law infringed upon merchants' free speech rights. Uh, so the state has rewritten the law. It took it only took it what uh, six years. Finally <laughs> uh, signed in. The, it was finally uh, passed in December, and okay. New York Governor Kathy Hochul um, signed in the law last last month. Um, last month, no, excuse me, two months ago in uh, December, and it became effective on the eleventh of February. The law requires businesses to post the total cost of the transaction, including the surcharge amount, if there is one, before a customer goes to checkout. They can either display the total price of an item, inclusive of the credit card surcharge, or list separate item prices for cash versus card. Violations right. um, are fine beginning at uh, $500 per. Uh, Important thing to notice is it also limits um, credit card surcharges to the actual processing costs. Right. Well, which, which again, I mean, is, is, is a, like these. Well, what I'm saying is that's actually not a, that big of a deal because, you know, ultimately that's what it usually is anyway. In fact, right. usually the surcharge isn't even as much as the processing it's, costs. Right. And that was right. the thing I so. just for ha ha's, I put a call into the New York uh, mm. Consumer Affairs Department because I was interested in this. It's like, well, wait a minute. So how do you decide? You know, how does the state right. make that determination? Right. Um, because there's different processing costs associated with different, you know, with different things. And I'm, right. I was just I'm very curious as to how they're going to enforce that. And I presume, right. though, it has to be a complaint by somebody for it to be enforced. Right. Which it would um, never be. I I, I think you know, no one's going to complain and say, I think they're surcharging me more than their cost. Right. Um, the complaint so. is going to be. I didn't see the entire price. Right. You know what I mean? And so right. then that's where you're going to start to have those problems. And and the way the law is written, the problem with it is it just doesn't really give very much uh, 
leeway of any kind I now at all. Right. right now you know it's interesting i mean the way it's written I, I don't know it's a bit of a toss-up for me as far as if it goes back to the supreme court what would happen would they still say that it's a violation of the merchant's free speech rights um now i don't know yeah i i, I, I was thinking about that earlier today when i was writing this up james and it's like mm, maybe but but i don't know it's, yeah because they you're basically saying you're giving them an either or type of description. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I have to say, and, and I'm obviously I'm not, you know, a huge fan of this particular law, but I mean, I do have to say this came from the state. I think right. that's where it should come from. You know, my, my big thing has always been visa trying to, you know, mandate this sort of thing uh, is, is not right. ideal. You don't want a private company enforcing uh, free speech rights. I think um, this is coming from a state. And so I, you know, I think it, it is what it is. And um, right. it's going to be a very interesting, I, I think, you know, I think what's so interesting about this, Patty, and I hadn't thought of it in this way until now, but um, I've talked about this before that I feel like our whole industry was poised for the shift to integrated payments, mm -hmm. right? With, with mm -hmm. ISOs and agents. And then, cash discounting and then dual pricing came along and right. in some ways actually pushed that trend back a little bit, not, not in, mm -hmm. in macro terms, but just as far as the ISOs and agents selling in it, it sure. opened the door for square and many others to come in. But um, I think what's interesting is laws like this, if this kind of law starts to spread to other States and things like that, I think what we're going to see is that it's going to go back to the ISV shift because it's going to fuel so that even more because right. what, what they're describing, I mean, you just, you can't do it on a terminal. No, you can't. I mean, can't it has be to be you have to have a customer facing screen. You have to have a, an ISV that's putting everything together the right way. You, you know, if it's a retail store, you have right. to have a label printer, you know, like there's and there's operational like, realities here, you know? Yeah, I was thinking about it when I was writing this up this morning. I was thinking about I, my family's in, in, in New York in upstate New York. And, you know, once or twice a year, I make that trek up the New York State Thruway. Right. And you stop at those Thruway rest stops. And there's like, you know, five different little businesses. Right. And I was thinking, oh, my God. I mean, and I, you know, I like the, I like the, because of what I do, I like to go into those businesses and look at the different things and yeah, sure. how they're pricing them and so forth. And I was just thinking, oh, my gosh, what a headache that's going to be for those people and their minimum wage employees to have to go through and relabel every single one of those tuna fish sandwiches and bottles of waters and apples and right right well one well, and i think ultimately varieties of shirts i mean ultimately the good news there is i mean you know they're going to have inventory turn right so right, right. you know they're going to have inventory turn usually 30 to 60 days anyway right, right. but i think again the idea more is that what's what's the practical like how are they going to do this moving forward and i think you're going to see big wins from the companies that have invested in the technology to right. do the label printing and to do all of this right. stuff. And, and even things like, um, you know, somebody is going to come out with the restaurant version of this, where it has mm. a really easy uh, menu printing uh -huh. that uh -huh. literally can, you can reprint because a lot of times yeah. they'll change, they'll change their prices on a, on a somewhat regular basis. Oh, They're going to sure, need a weekly. way to really inexpensively right. reprint menus that are like laminated single page. And I think you're going to see ISVs coming out where it's literally going to be like, Hey, we have compliant, dual pricing for your restaurant and wow. you also yeah. get this you also get this printer that comes with it that right. spits out you know 100 per 10 minutes we can spit out in 10 minutes we can give you 100 of these or 20 right. of these uh new menus with the reprinted prices or whatever so i, I think you're gonna, just going to see a lot more uh um, yeah, i think innovation, a lot more innovation that way i think yeah. yeah yeah good stuff thanks man